Welcome back to ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel, and this is Community Matters. And the title of our episode is Cliff Slater Writes About Transit and Does He Ever? It's growth, it's decline, and it's pending demise. That's going in distance, isn't it? So what's at the end of the road for transit? Here's a book cover. It's available on Amazon, and it's uh, absolutely worth looking at because it looked into the future and it connects all the dots about everything that has happened, not only locally, we'll talk about that, but nationally. You know, they, they used to say that as General Motors goes, so goes the nation. Well, I would like to say, and maybe Cliff will agree with me, as transit goes, so goes the nation. <laughs> Welcome to the okay. show, Cliff. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you. I, I, to I totally agree with you. I, I only mentioned Honolulu Rail twice, briefly. In the, in the book, um, uh, and I talk about it being the last gasp of the rail renaissance. Um, it is, it is so bad, <laughs> so far, okay, that that uh, that it it's not worth covering. Well, um, you've been covering this. You've been um, covering rail transit here in, in Hawaii, and and now on the national scene for thirty years. You're a businessman who turned into a, what do I call it, an urban planner, scholar person. And uh, this book and your efforts, your remarks, your positions on rail uh, at the time that Mufi Hanneman was forcing it down our throats, in my opinion, um, you know, have been very helpful to the, the public conversation. Unfortunately, the political winds, uh, you know, determined the result, and now we have the result. So let's let's talk about rail in Honolulu first, even though it's only mentioned in your book a couple of times. I remember you saying, and you said it a number of times in public, uh, I was on the neighborhood board at the time, and I was listening, uh, that rail wasn't going to work. Your thoughts about that? Your thoughts about whether the federal government has, has seen what you were saying? When I said that it was going to go over seven, $7 billion, he accused me of lying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, how you can lie about a forecast is, is beyond. Well, it's over ten billion now, and it's steaming its way to fifteen billion. So <laughs> I, I guess he should eat those words. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, Panos Provadoris, um, who I think more qualified than anybody, says that uh, he thinks it's just going to be fifteen billion dollars before it's all finished. Yeah. When, in the beginning, you know, when it first came out, when I was talking about seven billion, I never thought that they would be uh, there would be any cost overruns before they got to Dillingham. Okay, I mean, how can you get cost overruns in op building something in an open field? There's no obstruction. Okay, I, you know, it's just now. Now you 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 know they'll, they'll be going now into into uh, dense urban areas. Okay, it's, it gets to be quite tricky, especially when you get into uh, uh, the waterfront because that wa waterfront is is uh, most probably mostly fill land, okay, um, and so it's it's very plastic. Um, you you've got nothing so you're not dealing with anything that's really solid. The fact that they still don't have anybody and haven't from the beginning had anybody that has ever built the rail line, okay. Uh, and, as, let alone an elevated rail line. I mean, it, you know, it's been it's been an amateur operation from the beginning. Oh, well, they've had a lot of politicians in there. Yeah, and they've got a lot of qualified engineers. But rail is a different different bird altogether. And uh, you know, you need, really need to get real expertise. Even then, you've got to be prepared for cost overruns. What about the, the ridership? You know, um, it started out what, last summer with the uh, inaugural trip, and it's still working. It's still working on the inaugural trip um, because not a lot of people are taking it, even though it's uh, supposed to be functioning. Your thoughts about ridership in the beginning, in the middle, and the end? Well, first, first off, I think it was an error on their part uh, to carry people from. Nowhere to nowhere. Okay, I mean, it's, they can't expect to have any ridership. 
that, that was that was really an error because people finish up laughing at them. I think in time, uh, when they eventually get to Ala Moana, that they will, their ridership will be, I would say, I, I think about a quarter of what they, they forecast it. And that, that was based on, if you look at uh, uh, all the other rail lines that have been built, especially the, the elevated ones, and you look at the riders per million of population, and you look at the riders per uh, length of, uh, of, of track, um, you, you, come up, you come up with a number that's like 25% of what they're forecasting. Well, it sounds like a, a boat. A boat. It sounds like a boat. You know what a boat is? A boat is a hole in the water into which you pour money. Uh, and uh, a rail sounds like a, a, a hole in the ground into which you pour money because uh, it's going to get worse, not better. Am I right? It's going to get more expensive as it gets older, right? Yeah. Oh, yes. That, that's the problem. Is, is, is They keep saying, you know, once you've got a rail line, it's in, it's forever. It's not forever at all. They, they start replacing rails as, as, in as little as 15, 15 years. Um, the average, I think, is twenty-five years. That's just the rail, and then and then the uh, the refurbishing of the of, of the of the trains themselves. Uh, um, they don't last that long. You've got a lot of people. Of course, you know when you don't have many people riding, then they will last longer. Um, no, but the loss every expensive. day is greater. It's yeah. a loss every single day. Well, the big thing is that, that they, they, they try to hide the, the, the maintenance costs, okay? But in addition to the maintenance, there is the, the, the replacement, the replacement and refurbishing. And this is the thing that always comes as a surprise when somebody says, uh, uh, we need another $20 million to do X. Okay, uh, we need fifty million dollars to do this, and it and it just adds up to the time. By the time fifty years rolls around, you you'll have spent pretty much what it cost you to build in the first place. One of the issues that came up when uh, you you gave me a ride uh, on a bus, you arranged a bus from uh, what uh, West Oahu into town, following the path of the then planned uh, rail, and uh, we, we drove through, and what was clear to me is that wherever the rail went, it was going to have an elevated rail, as in New York, as in the you know Third Avenue subway and all that. It has an effect on the neighborhood, doesn't it? Yes. And that's permanent. Um, you, you, can, you can't really undo that so well. And where you can see the mountains and the ocean and the sky uh, in or around um, this elevated rail, that's gone. Um, is that is that something that we should be concerned about now? Very much so. Very much so. That portion when the, when the uh, rail transitions from from uh, Dillingham over to Nimitz um, and thus Moana, okay, you've got two two major stations there. Chinatown and downtown, um, and you know they, they're just going to just going to wall off the uh, the, uh, the ocean view. Yeah. Well, the other the other thing, and I I haven't followed this. Maybe you have. Is that when you're going to build rail, you have to cut the corners of a square block. In other words, the the rail doesn't go ninety degrees. It it goes in an easy gradual arc around the corner of that block. So you have to condemn um, a good part of that block to accommodate that arc. And I don't think they ever finished acquiring the land and the rights to move that rail anywhere. I'm, I don't know where it stops, but I don't think it goes to Ala Moana, certainly. And they have not planned for or acquired the rights to go there. So if and when, and maybe never, 
um, they decide to go as far as they were talking about to Ala Moana, it's going to cost them a fortune because they haven't done it yet. Am I right? I'm not sure about that part. Um, I know that it's still it's it's still an um, open open situation on on a good number of parcels that they need. Mm. Um, but I mean, you, you know, they'll condemn it. Nobody can stop them from condemning it. And the condemnation suits can get very political, yeah. especially around uh, what is reasonable compensation for the rights being condemned. It's not okay. like a fee simple thing. It's, just, it's other than that, and you have to have a a bunch of appraisers trying to trying to figure out what it's worth. Let me yeah. go to a, Pete. Pete Buttigieg came here last week. What was the significance of his visit? What what's the takeaway from his visit? And uh, how is that going to affect things? I was remember uh, another former uh, former Department of Transportation guy who rolled in and testified at City Council that this was a marvelous, you know, this was a marvelous thing for the for the city, and and I later found he'd been paid ten thousand dollars for that. Yeah, that's what happens. So somewhere in here, you know, you were the, the gadfly. Uh, you were the, you and Panos Prevaduros, I should add, uh, were talking about the city planning considerations and whether this was going to work. And um, you concluded that it was not going to work. And you were a very strong voice for that proposition for a long time. But in the end, it was determined by political considerations and MUFI and unions and what have you. And here we are. Um, somewhere in there, you got to be national. Somewhere in there, you started focusing on learning about, writing about um, the national transit scene as reflected in your book, um, Transit, Its Growth, Decline, and Pending Demise, which just came out. Um, and it's available on Amazon and elsewhere. And here's the cover. Um, and I'm very interested in Okay, you had you had a correction to what I said. It's available on Amazon, except to Hawaii residents. You can't you can't you can't buy it if you're a Hawaii resident. What is it? Radioactive? Um, I don't know. When you try to buy it, you, you, they take you all the way to the end and then tell you that uh, there's a, something wrong with your address and you can't ship to that address. Okay. No, not okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, ha having spent uh, uh, many, many hours uh, getting the runaround from Pan uh, from uh, Amazon, I finally concluded that that uh, something that I had, had suspicions earlier, but now I'm of, of the opinion that Amazon needs a lot of city permissions for their new warehouse and and the city has, has leaned on it. Hmm. I can't that's a story that. that's a story all in itself if that's an outrage yeah so anyway you got involved in uh, looking at rail from a national point of view and you wrote this book it is chock block it's a masterwork on rail in these united states it goes into so many issues and historical developments and, and um, you know, public officials. Uh, and you have a picture um, of um, Lyndon Johnson on the cover. Um, that's got to have a significance. Do you want to talk about the history and how Lyndon Johnson got involved and um, what the, the, the track of the book and the coverage so we will all know where, where rail has taken us nationally? When the first move was made with the uh, urban mass transportation uh, bill of, of uh, 1962, in that uh, Kennedy was involved and uh, he was quite clear that he wanted, uh, where possible, he wanted everything to be uh, private, profitable, um, people would pay appro appro appropriately um, and uh, 
and there was yeah, it was a really a really a free mark. His message to um, message to to Congress in 1962 that that was a a free market statement if you ever wanted one. So then he was assassinated, and uh, so then we have Johnson takes over, and John the bill. That, Johnson signed in 1964 was at the absolute antithesis of, of what Kennedy had wanted, but he still didn't get any money. You know, they passed the act, okay, but they didn't fund it. So it went until 1970. There's another bill in 1970, and that, to everyone's surprise, um, was funded. Uh, with a lot of strong arming, uh, was funded by Nixon to the tune of uh, ten million, ten billion dollars, which was a lot of money in those days. So that's so it's, you know it was a real bipartisan effort. So you know what I get from your book and from the review of it is that we started out with the Kennedy approach, entrepreneurs private capital, building rail systems, and other transit systems around the country. Um, and that was successful. But somewhere along the line, the federal government got involved, and it essentially caused government to buy up the positions of all these private entrepreneurs. And so you, you look on phase one, it was owned and operated by private capital. And phase two, it was owned pretty much you know, all of it was owned pretty much by municipal, state, and, and federal capital. And, and when, you know, uh, if, if I'm going to buy, if I'm going to build a rail system, you know, uh, God, this, this is an adage about building railroads here. If I'm going to build a rail system, I don't want government doing it. Uh, I want, in this country, I want private industry doing it. So we went from private industry to government running rail. Uh, and, and government has the money for sure, but does government have the management skills? Does government have the ability to actually run these systems? And was that a good move? I take it from your book and from the reviews of it that you don't feel it was a good move at all. No. It take, for example, it, it takes um, twice as many uh, people to run transit today uh, for the, the, the expense and and the employees uh, for for the, for each hundred thousand rides it takes twice as twice as much um, today as it did when it was private in 1970. And you can't you can't run a railroad that way. Yeah, I think, you know the the other thing is with the rail when they started to build it. Um, it was it was in private hands. Okay, then over time, governments took it over because they felt they needed for the for employees. Okay, uh, but the buses stayed private. Okay, but so as we as we get to say 1960, um, the, the buses bus companies are largely private. Okay, and the Rail lines, leaving leaving aside these streetcars, that that was all that was all government run. Okay, now so now we get, and this is where we get into the urban transportation bill. Is this is where they 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 made they made it, and they were very obvious about it. And I show, and I show that in the book. Uh, Congress were quite obvious in their their intent to, to socialize the bus system. That's right. And indeed, it got socialized because the government was willing to pay the entrepreneurs at least fair market value and maybe more. And the entrepreneurs are only too happy to sell it to the government. Right? We had that here mm -hmm. with the buses, the bus system. Right. It used yeah. to be private. Yeah, Harry Weinberg. Which Harry Weinberg. Yeah. And that, that that bus system was was um, pri uh, private and profitable till the day it was taken over by the uh, the city. 
the the other thing I I, I think it's uh, appropriate to include in our conversation here is the technology. The one thing about about rail and you know fixed infrastructure like this is it's very hard to change it. And if the community changes, um, and of course it changes the community, such as we are seeing with Honolulu Rail now. But if the community around it changes, and more importantly, if the technology changes, you've got a big problem on your hands because it no longer fits within a dynamic urban plan. Can you comment on that? Well, you've got a perfectly good example um, of where um, two things, Uber uh, and remote work, that's caused a um, that's caused about a one third drop in the in the rail, and that's that's caused real problems for everybody, even if they don't want to admit it. And most are really ad admitting it now. Okay, well, what are we going to do now? You know, uh, under the Biden administration, we we have a, a priority for infrastructure, and that certainly includes rail and the Department of Transportation and Pete uh, Buttigieg. Um, but but the reality is uh, the government, to maintain the rail system, the transit system that has been built or is in the process of being built in this country, it's going to cost the federal government a lot of money. And the um, fact is that rail is expensive. It's in the billions every time you look. Right. Uh, and that is always more than you thought. And so uh, uh, when you, you know, the government, the federal government is not a bottomless pit of money. When you talk about the fiscal policy going forward, and you include rail that we don't actually need, this creates a, a national problem. I think that's what you're saying, is it? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we're we're um, like in chapter six, for example, I show that the recovery from um, from COVID um, <clears throat> of of the rail, and you see it come up to. Uh, the ridership up to uh, one third less than it was in 2019, and it's, it's seems stuck there. But Uber is doing better than it did in 2019, and the cars and traffic flow is the same as it was before, it has been for some time. From the outset, even from the day uh, when you took me for that bus ride from West Oahu, this is all a question of urban planning urban development. Mm -hmm. um, it's a question of uh, putting the roads where they should be. Um, it's a question of maintaining the roads, uh, managing the roads, and, you know, in general, planning the expansion of the city. And what, one of the big focus points in that period of time was uh, Kaka'ako, which I must say is really not a successful venture, a successful chapter in urban planning in Honolulu, that's my opinion anyway. But, but query, when you have a situation where the downtown is becoming less relevant, um, vacancies are going up downtown, mm -hmm. uh, landlord, uh, landlord profit profitability is going down, um, and rail is going to serve these areas with fewer and fewer riders because um, you know, remote work, as you said, has changed. So how does the city, the the urban authorities, including the federal government that supports the urban authorities, how do they modify the original plan and expectations on the basis of which they provided and promised to provide many tens of billions of dollars around the country? How, how does the change how should they, can they adapt to that change? I don't think that, that uh, rail in time or rail or, or transit in, in time is going to be relevant. Um, it doesn't provide really what people want. Um, you, you know, was one of the things that, uh, that I looked at recently didn't have I don't have it in the book, but I um, put it on the website. What's the name of the website? Uh, Cliffslater.com. Thank you. And, uh, and that is that a, in Los Angeles, that Uber is cheaper than light rail. 
Let me offer it's also more democratic. If I need transportation, I call Uber. I pay for that. Yeah. Um, the other guy who doesn't need transportation, um, he doesn't pay for it. So there's, there's, there's an equity there. If, I, if I'm getting the benefit, I'm paying the cost. Uh, when you have a community uh, infrastructure like rail, everybody pays, even those who never use it. You know, you 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 uh, you imply, Cliff, that over a period of time, as rail becomes irrelevant, not only in Honolulu, um, a transit, I should say, but elsewhere in the country, where you know it doesn't keep up with changes in the urban dynamic, where um, people have other ways to get around or they don't need to get around, uh, rail becomes irrelevant, and thus, um, you know, it falls into disrepair. It falls into even disuse. Maybe the authorities that wanted to have it before no longer want to have it. Uh, what happens to a, a 10 or $15 billion project that is essentially irrelevant? What happens over 5, 10, 15 years uh, to that project and to the community that it, 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 it runs through? Well, it's a problem. So, so I wish they would not, uh, you know, the damage is done as far as bringing the rail in as far as Middle Street, but I wish they'd stop there because to go across to go across our waterfront, um, no reasonable future for, for ridership. Um, you know, uh, one, one of the things about building concrete, such as we have done in Kakaraka, is that you can say for a mortgage or a lease, you can say, oh, this has a useful life of, say, 50 years, mm -hmm. or maybe even 100 years. But in fact, the structure in concrete is going to last a lot longer than that. And it's going to take some kind of action. You know, in Singapore, um, buildings in concrete have to come down after a period of time. They can't just stay up there and get old. We don't have that in Hawaii or in the United States. Can't force the you know demolition of a building unless it's um you know dangerous in some way but uh, my my thought is that uh, gee whiz if you build it in concrete it has a useful life really of hundreds of years and the cost of removing it is astronomical i mean if it costs 10 or 15 billion dollars to build honolulu rail or any rail system transit system in a similar city it costs the same amount to tear it down, right? I don't think so because they don't they don't need the engineering staff to to pull it down. It's, it's just you know that's just a uh, construction folks will take it. Down. I, I accept that, but it, it isn't easy though. Yeah, well, well you know it, the 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 the, um, the environmental work. That has gone into this thing. I mean, the cost the trains that are just a minor, minor cost in in this thing. But let me let me uh, let me go further and say, if, if you if you were in charge of this, and and I'm not, I suppose I'm bifurcating my question. If you were in charge of what has happened here in Honolulu, and in like cities, like systems elsewhere, which have been supported by the federal government to the tune of many tens of billions, um, what would you do with a rail system that doesn't work? What would you do with it? How would you change it? How would you demolish it or abandon it? What do you do with all these very expensive systems that the federal government has paid for and managed? Well, I, I guess the, the place you'd go look at uh, would be New York, because they they had all elevated rail, they, uh, and they uh, took it all down. Yeah, I mentioned the Third Avenue L yeah. a little while ago, which was really it was awful to be anywhere near that elevated rail. People hated to be there. They took it all down, and all of a sudden there was sunshine again, sunlight. Yeah, um, and that was because people really hated it, and they politically required it to take it down. And so uh, that was a good move, and that was a, the logical extension of all of this, isn't it? 
I think so. There, there are certain things that we could do. Um, take it, take it to Middle Street, and uh, have it join up with there with uh, with buses. Look at look at look at that as a as a possibility. Um, our original proposal to the city, which they lied about, um, was that we could have um, for a lot less money than they were then proposing for the for rail, that five million dollars, we five billion. Uh, we were proposing a um, a, a three lane. Uh, elevated highway that would would come into town, basically to to uh, Middle Street and to pick up stuff in the uh, cars in the in in the uh, couple A area mm. and, and and bring them in and. Uh, um, Spread them out over 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 downtown. Um, that could have been done for 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 a lot less. It, as a um, we got that example from the one in Tampa, uh, Florida, where where they did exactly exactly that. They they built they built built ten miles of it uh, for like something four hundred million dollars. Memory serves me right. I mean, it was just unbelievably inexpensive um now given hawaii's union stuff um uh, and cost of living uh, it may have cost us double that but there's still nothing like um what uh the, the rail has cost and will continue to cost what about um national policy what is what does pete put judge do what is what does the administration in a given administration do to alleviate this problem? How, here's a question. How can we reverse the Lyndon Johnson shift, the Richard Nixon shift, and go back to private ownership instead of federal and municipal ownership? Is that, is that a possibility? And if so, how could we do it? Well, first off, just give, just take up the thought of, of Uber being cheaper than light rail, okay? Um, and think in terms uh, also of, of uh, the forthcoming driverless automobiles, okay, buses. Um, when you can have a, a four-passenger four passenger bus and working automatically, uh, utilizing Uber-like uh, uh, software. Um, exactly how that would work, um, I don't know, but I think we have to think in those terms. And and I think that, I, I don't think, I think what will happen is that people will just abandon the rail because you know the, th the thing that kills kills transit and always has is is affluence as we get more affluent uh, transit becomes it, it has become for many years now um, an inferior good um, the more money you have the less you want of it I, I think that it, the thing, the rail will. I just think, just let's say, let's say they build it as far as uh, Almora Center. Um, they're not going to have much, much to to uh, ridership as they anticipate, and and so, but they're going to have the expense. Okay, over and over here, we've got people starting to operate automatic. Bands will take people door to door on call, okay? um, and the automatic vans will have 
will have access to the to the uh, the shopping center. <laughs> no, the the the, the hot lanes. The, uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. As that stuff impacts more, and Uber Pool becomes automatic, uh, then I, I just see that transit fading away. And then, and then you, you finish up being left with the infrastructure, okay? So that they, you've got a problem. But you always anticipated. You always warned us about that. And your book is a warning about that. So are you going to write another one? Are you going to write a sequel? Uh, sort of like I told you so sort of thing? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. You know, I see some of the some of the things that have been fun in the history. Uh, for example, I I find that in London, um, when uh, buses were all private until 1930. Okay, now prior to that time, they had no fixed stops for buses. Okay, if you wanted a bus, you hailed one going by. Okay. And if you wanted to to stop, you hung on the bell. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was no there's no fixed stops anywhere. Mm -hmm. So they're and they're private. I'm thinking, and I'm still looking into this. I'm thinking if it, if they're private and they are resisting the change that some people are calling for at the time, then it must be more profitable for them to not have stops a good point okay now going from taking our local buses from no not from stops to no stops you know that's, that's going to take a little bit of work <laughs> well you know it costs money to make a bus stop and uh, <laughs> there'll be people who will oppose that as, oh, as well, they do yeah of course in the end of the day you know it's it's not just urban planning it's it's politics yeah. oh um, yes and it's uh, it's kind of the reverse of NIMBY. Uh, I want you to have a bus stop at my door. <laughs> you know, when, when, I, when I first started to, to do this is when Frank Fassi got reelected in 1984 and then proposed, uh, proposed the, the rail system. And I just started to look at the financials financial projections okay and i thought to myself this doesn't work okay this is ridiculous so my wife and i went to the various senators okay and they went oh because i thought well they just don't know what they're getting into okay and and uh and after talking to not too many of them who all thanked me for taking time out of my busy day okay <laughs> uh, Uh, well, you know, you have you have you have dedicated. May I say, aside from the fact you had a career with uh, Maui Divers, you founded that company and you were a businessman first. But yeah. then somewhere along the line, you got into uh, rail in Honolulu and, and now National Rail, and you have dedicated your life to that. So, I want to say um, that I truly appreciate the contributions you have made to the public conversation about it. And I hope uh, people go and find that book and look at that book. And if they're worried about it, um, you know, not not getting to them because of this twist with Amazon, uh, then what they could do is uh, send it to their families on the mainland <laughs> and have and have their families send it to them here in Hawaii. <laughs> but they can get it to Barnes and Noble. Ah, there you go. All right. Thank you very much for that who don't have a warehouse <laughs> <laughs> simple <laughs> okay well cliff it's been great to talk to you and catch up with you i haven't seen you in a long time and it's really a joy to be able to share our thoughts together and and, uh, and hear what you're doing and hear about this book i wish you all all the best in every way cliff, cliff slater uh, a businessman who has uh, seen the light on rail and who has expressed himself uh, for decades and decades 
it's it's great for the public conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you.